Good afternoon, everyone. Um, our today's same session will be on uh, urinary uh, tract stone disease. So before proceeding to the main presentation, I'll start off by uh, saying a little bit about yet uh, uh, in and uh, what it, uh, what it does. So. So yeah, so it in is a volunteer network, uh, has digital uh, platform. It's an, it's registered as a nonprofit uh, in Pennsylvania, um, USA, and it's entirely operated by uh, volunteers. And currently we have uh, 70 active uh, volunteers spanning over five uh, different countries and we're counting more. Uh, so it in is engaged in different uh, projects, uh, different projects, uh, and they are divided into four uh, main areas. Uh, the first one being has promotion, um, has promotion team, community engagement, a mentorship and skill sharing, and our very own med um, medical um, same, uh, same meeting, working on medical um, education and also researching uh, QI projects. Um, so we are more than a digital platform. It in all has uh, um, has engaged in uh, different impact, impactful initiatives, starting from organizing a blood drive, uh, fundraising uh, initiatives in order uh, to aid uh, different charitable um, activities, um, as well as to equity and uh, as well as uh, as well as working on uh, equity. Uh, project is. Uh, so these are pictures from our health and art exhibitions that was held in the uh, Ethiopian New Year uh, 2016. Um, and we engage, uh, we try to engage and reach the community uh, by doing different screening activities, uh, by organizing blood donation, um, as well as health awareness activities, and also um, showcase the uh, interrelation between health and art. And the other picture that you see on the top right uh, is um, uh, yet in all donating hearing aid. Uh, and different equipment to um, children uh, with hearing disabilities. And these are a few of the projects that we have done so far. And one of the initiatives that ITNOG is proud of is yet an Doha Health Article uh, Writing Competition that's done in collaboration with um, Ethiopian Medical Students Associ Association. And we have had uh, several winners over the years, and uh, they have been awarded starting from a stethoscope pulse oximeter to health uh, travel uh, to a travel grant. And these are our winners from 2021. And these are our 2023 winners who were given the travel grant to uh, Rwanda. And uh, the other one is uh, the research fellowship work that we do in collaboration with uh, uh, Roha, in, in this case specifically with Adsaba uh, University Medical uh, Faculty. Uh, and we had an abstract competition where uh, we had uh, four uh, winners. Um, two from the Department of Internal Medicine, one from Radiology and the other one from Oncology. Um, and uh, the other one is uh, the other one is also done in collaboration with Roha, but it was more focused on medical students. And this project has been launched with two uh, research grants th that are given uh, to students in St. Paul Hospital Millennial Medical College. And so our winners uh, from the research fellowship that I have mentioned earlier on. So come coming uh, to our uh, semi, um, our sessions are freely accessible. And we work in partnership with different uh, health uh, medical, health professional association like uh, Ethiopia Medical Association, our um, Society of Cardiac Professionals, and also Society of Internal Medicine. And we also invite different uh, renowned, experienced uh, local speakers as well as international speakers in order to uh, add, in order to provide continued training for our healthcare professionals and. Uh, for our healthcare professionals. And so far, we have con conducted over 30 CMEs. And then this year, we're planning to conduct uh, 30, uh, 30 webinars that will be focusing on emergency, uh, emergency surgical and also uh, medical cases in the pediatrics or BGYN and oncology um, cases. So in case you're wondering where you can access our previously recorded CMEs, because all of them are uh, interesting uh, topics and with updated knowledge and uh, information as well. So you can uh, check them out on our YouTube uh, channel. Uh, the link uh, will be uh, the links will be shared to not only the YouTube channel but also uh, to our other social media uh, outlets. So uh, any activity, if you want an update on any activities related to it, and all, please join our Telegram channel and also our other social media um, outlets and. Uh, for you to also access the PowerPoints from the same sessions, uh, you also uh, need to join our Telegram uh, uh, channel. 
so uh, housekeeping rule in order for us to have a better webinar experience is um, if you have any uh, questions, uh, attach it on the Q&A uh, box or on the, uh, or the chat box, um, and uh, it will be uh, forwarded to our uh, guest speaker at the end of the webinar. And regarding the CEU point, you will be required to attend uh, the whole uh, the whole Zoom uh, webinar. Uh, we will be uh, reviewing the report uh, in order to see the duration that you have stayed in. And um, after attending, uh, you will be required to fill in the quiz uh, Google form, and you will be required to score 50% uh, or more in order to get your CEU points. We will get the result right away, but please be patient with us as the certificates will be forwarded to you one or two uh, weeks uh, later. And moving on to um, introducing uh, our guest speaker today, um, it's Dr. Abisolom Lama, um, and he did his undergraduate medical uh, he did his undergraduate medical uh, studies and postgraduate urology specialty training at Addis Ababa University with multiple uh, multiple trainings abroad and in the country as well. And he's currently serving as an assistant professor of urology department of uh, surgery in uh, the Grand Vista Specialist Hospital. He is well published with research focusing on antimicrobial resistance uh, and stewardship with growing influence in the field of uh, urology, particularly in the urology, retral structure disease, and erectile dysfunction management in its web. So without uh, further ado, I would like to give the floor uh, to uh, Dr. Abi Silom to proceed with the presentation. Okay, thank you uh, for that uh, warm uh, present uh, introduction. Uh, we'll go ahead uh, with the presentation. So this is, this will be uh, my slides. Uh, I hope you can see my slides. Can you see, can you see my slides? Yes, it's visible. Okay, thank you. So this will be an outline of my. Uh, discussion. We will make it uh, as much as possible, try to keep it short and uh, really to the point because uh, discussing uh, excessive details is not necessary. Uh, the pathophysiology and uh, especially the metabolic workup and uh, preventive uh, steps for stones are still a very much uh, challenge even in the West. Uh, that is why uh, there is a growing uh, technology and inter uh, interventional uh, uh, changes, but not really significant changes when it comes to uh, prevention. So we'll discuss about prevalence etiology, uh, how common is stones in our country. We'll discuss about the classifications, uh, what is really the recommended diagnostic evaluations and some of the management options we provide in our uh, country. Uh, so stones really depend on geographical, climatic, ethnic, dietary, uh, familial, and genetic factors. Uh, so uh, unfortunately, Ethiopia is part of the international stone belt, which is really uh, uh, a hypothetical belt that travels through uh, mostly through the equator. So Ethiopia, the Middle East, India, these countries, Egypt, these countries are very common uh, for having a significant burden of stones. And unfortunately, uh, from our practice, at least we find that patients have really hard stones compared to uh, other countries, which may have uh, you know, relatively softer stones. So which really, it affects the management option as we see uh, in, in, the, in the coming uh, discussion. So re regarding the prevalence, some of the recently published data that we have is, uh, one is from uh, Magalay where we have uh, uh, just 562 adult patients who are attending the surgical outpatient uh, department and they selected uh, five hospitals in Tigray. And the prevalence of stones disease, whether it was symptomatic or not, was about 14%. Um, and one uh, paper that was uh, published from St. Paul's mentions that about 30% of uh, urological admissions were uh, stone-related. Of course, this may be some bias that we, uh, St. Paul's and Black Lane are uh, centers for stone management, but uh, it's a very common disease. And especially in the South, uh, patients do come with significant stones. The stones may sometimes complicate usually in our country. Unfortunately, patients delay their management. Uh, so stone uh, urolithiasis is, does have a quite high burden in our country. Uh, so it's, a, it's, a, it's very important to have an idea of what to do, uh, how to investigate these patients and how to intervene uh, early before there is any significant uh, kidney loss. Uh, 
So uh, most of you know that this is uh, the stone classification. We classify stones based on their composition, based on uh, their cause. So we have some group of non-infectious stones, which are really the highest number is calcium oxalate. Close to 70, 80% of uh, urolithic acids are calcium oxalate. Then we have calcium phosphate, uric acid stones. And with infection, we have uh, magnesium ammonium phosphate, which is related to uh, recurrent infections by urea splitting organisms like proteus um, and ammonium urate. And there are some genetic abnormalities that predispose people for uh, stones such as cysteine stones, xanthine stones. And some patients who take medications on a chronic basis may be, may be predisposed for unucleation of this uh, uh, drug chemicals as, and they may form stones like uh, indinavir for uh, patients who, check, who take uh, HIV medication. So what are the risk groups? So uh, the, risk, uh, the, the risk of recurrence for stones because it is usually a stone is uh, a symptom of some kind of uh, biochemical abnormality in our blood or urine. So once a person has formed a stone, the recent uh, reviews show that there is a calculated recurrence rate of about 26% in five years time. Uh, so unfortunately, unless we do some drastic measures to uh, reduce the recurrence, then recurrence is quite likely to be ha to happen. And about 50% of stone formers may have only one time stone recurrence. So they may not have more than uh, two times uh, stone recurrence. But stone uh, urolithiasis is, is usually an indicator of uh, one abnormality. So uh, that's something to consider. So some factors that are associated with your uh, recurrence of urolithiasis uh, includes, uh, you know, early on sort of urolithiasis, especially when they're ch children or teenagers. Family history is a very important uh, risk factor for urolithiasis. Uh, patients who are obviously recurrent stone formers. Uh, recurrence within a short period of time uh, when the stone is uric acid containing, uh, it's likely to be uh, to have recurrence and if they are really uh, related to infections and other specific factors. Uh, for example, if somebody has suffers from cysteine urea, then they will likely have recurrent cysteine stones. So we can classify stones like uh, I mentioned a few slides earlier. Uh, based on their uh, biochemical uh, uh, composition. But we can also uh, classify stones based on their appearance on imaging modalities. And this really matters because uh, which type of treatment we will recommend for one patient as opposed to another patient is really dependent on uh, the stone parameters. Uh, uh, at the end of the day, uh, a urologist really does recommend one treatment over the other, and it's usually individualized because it is uh, there are some uh, treatment options which will best fit one patient and will may not fit one another patient. So we can classify them based on size, location, X-ray characteristics, the etiology, whether they are infectious or non-infectious, their composition and risk of recurrence. So. Uh, whenever we suspect somebody as having a urolithiasis, then we obviously need to, to uh, recommend some urological investigations. And uh, usually, the, you know most of the different uh, options of investigations we can recommend, but it will really be determined by the clinical situations. We will not recommend everything for uh, all patients. Uh, so the patient's clinical uh, situation is really important. Uh, and whether we are suspecting a kidney stone versus a ureteric stone may sometimes have an, have an impact on which type of investigation we should recommend. Uh, obviously, a medical history is very important. Physical examination is very important. Most of our patients, especially when they come with acute ureteric colic, do, they do come with flank pain, uh, with occasional vomiting and nausea, and sometimes fever. Those would indicate usually an obstruction of the urinary tract. Uh, and this is a very important symptom. Especially, especially, I would like to stress on the presence of uh, nausea and vomiting because uh, most of uh, the kidney or ureteric stones, they will cause uh, acute obstruction resulting in stretching of the kidney capsule. 
which the body will uh, interpret as uh, a sort of uh, uh, autonomic noxious stimuli. So the, the body will not try determine whether this is a GI or urological uh, noxious stimuli. So patients usually have vomiting and nausea. If not vomiting, they usually have nausea. So if a patient has flank pain with vomiting, it's very likely to be of a urological reason. But if the vomiting or nausea is absent, uh, it has been a, our clinical experience that maybe there's this, uh, most likely a musculoskeletal uh, problem. So our history and physical examination are very uh, important because we will need to determine whether a patient has uh, just a simple stone, simple obstruction, infection with obstruction, obstruction with uh, kidney deterioration. And this kind of classification of patients is very critical of when, whether we will need to uh, order a specific set of investigations or whether we will need to immediately intervene uh, as sometimes that may be related to life-threatening conditions. Coming to the imaging options, uh, obviously most of, most of us have access to ultrasound and it is still, still is the number one most preferred mode of investigation when we are suspecting urolithiasis. Uh, for all the obvious reasons, it's uh, very cheap, available most of the time, it has no radiation. It can even sometimes be, by, by, be performed by a trained physician, which is not necessarily a radiologist. And in the, in the field of urology, it is considered as uh, the, the stethoscope for a urologist. So an ultrasound is very critical. We can easily pick out if there are stones, especially large stones above five millimeter can be easily seen. And more important than the appearance of the stone is hydronephrosis. So if we, if we see any dilation of the pelvic calicial system or the ureter, we would need to suspect the presence of stone, but it has obviously a limited ability to detect ureteric stones. So uh, once you go down from the uh, pelvis to the proximal ureter, anything below that is going to be uh, surrounded by bowel. So it's not going to be easy to see a stone inside a ureter with an ultrasound, but the stone usually will cause obstruction and dilation of the ureter. So if somebody comes to you with a flank pain, with nausea or with vomiting and you suspect a ureteric stone, you don't exactly have to see the stone. You just have to see hydronephrosis. And if, especially if there is hydro, hydroureter, it is very likely to be of urolithiasis and ureteric obstruction. So ultrasound is still the number one uh, entry option for diagnostic uh, services regarding urolithiasis. A KUB X-ray is a second alternative but it does have reduced sensitivity of 44 to 77% for kidney stones. So it is usually more useful for follow-up rather than diagnosis, uh, especially when you take an X-ray and you look at the part of the ureter, which is in the middle, the middle or what we routinely call the middle ureter, which is on top of the iliac bone or the pelvic bone. Uh, Finding a stone on that area is very difficult to see. Uh, so it needs some experience. And then we come for uh, CT. So right now, uh, internationally, a CT scan is the best tool for picking up a stone. Uh, a CT scan has a very high uh, sensitivity for kidney and ureteric stones. And it is significantly more accurate than IVP, ultrasound, or a KUB in detecting urolithiasis. And especially, especially in the setting of acute flank pain, where you may have, you know, about 50% of patients maybe, uh, they may have a normal ultrasound if they come to you within 48 hours of the on onset of the pain. In times like that, it is very, very useful because a CT scan does not require uh, fasting. A CT scan does not require bowel preparation like a KUB x-ray. Uh, so it is really the gold standard. Uh, so the international recommendation would be if somebody has acute urethric colic and you are suspecting a stone, you just do a CT scan and you can do the CT scan uh, low dose. So there is a modification where the technicians use a low dose of radiation 
So the fear of radiation can be reduced. So uh, the CT scan, especially non-contrast CT scan is very, very useful. Uh, on a, you know, as you can see on these images, so you can see on the picture above that on the right side, just this is a, say the ISO dense structure in the middle between the two bones is the bladder. And you see on the right side of the patient, there is a small five millimeter ureteric stone, which is very unlikely to be picked up by a KUB. And on the lower picture, you can see the right kidney as having a very big uh, pelvic stone. So these things are, uh, the CT gives us so much information. It can give us information regarding the size of the stone. It can give us information regarding the density of the stone, which is an important uh, parameter that we use uh, when we recommend minimally invasive treatments. We can uh, measure the skin to stone distance, which is a, a, another important parameter because with, uh, when we are recommending people uh, for show pavlito tripsy exam, for example, we don't want to do this on obese patients because the waves will not reach the stone. So we can measure that with a CT scan. We cannot measure that with a uh, ultrasound, not accurately at least, and we cannot get any information with a KUB. And it will also give us information regarding the surrounding anatomy, whether there is inflammation, perinephric collection, uh, sometimes there are uh, congenital anomalies where there is colon behind the kidney. So those, that's also very important information for a urologist when we are planning, especially percutaneous uh, surgical options. Uh, when it comes to uh, non-contrast CT, uh, so the last line says NCCT versus CTU. So that means it's non-contrast CT scan versus a CT urography. So a CT urography, just for your information, is a CT scan which is done with the administration of IV contrast. Uh, so we do a non-contrast CT scan first. We look at the stone. Then after maybe five minutes, we do uh, uh, arterial imaging, or just maybe one to two minutes, we do arterial imaging. So we do a second CT. Then after maybe 10 minutes, we do a third CT, looking at the excretion of the kidney. And maybe after maybe like 30 minutes, if we, if we do it properly, we, see, we do another CT. So it's about four CT scans for the same patient. So which would mean an increased risk of radiation, which would mean an increased risk of contrast exposure. So when we compare the two, uh, there is no significant advantage of doing a CT urography, that is CT with contrast, unless we are suspecting there is a either severe kidney damage. So if we want to see if the if there is contrast excretion from that kidney, or if we are suspecting a cortical lesion at the same time, like a tumor, unless we are suspecting things like this, for a regular person where the ultrasound shows a relatively normal kidney or some moderate hydronephrosis, non-contrast CT scan is enough. And this really is uh, an important line because we are thinking uh, of uh, radiation exposure and in the field of radiation exposure, uh, there is a principle called ALARA, A-L-A-R-A, -A, which means as low as reasonably achievable. So a non-contrast CT gives us enough information regarding stones in most patients where we don't need a CT urography. But if we are planning some complex things, we may consider a CT urography. So I personally recommend if a patient does not have previous surgery or significant severe hydronephrosis, I recommend just doing a non-contrast CT as it is safer for the patient and also cheaper because there is no cost of contrast contrast use. In addition to that, of course, you need some basic laboratory tests, especially if it's non-emergency urolithiasis. So a urinalysis is very, very useful, especially in the field of urology. It is our CBC. So uh, especially with regard to stones, uh, the most important uh, finding is usually microscopic hematuria. So if you have somebody with blank pain and microscopic hematuria, it's very, very likely to be a stone because the stone does kind of irritate the mucosa, do some microscopic damage to the mucosa, and there will be some microscopic hematuria. From the blood tests, you can do urine, uh, you know, renal function tests, uric acid levels, electrolytes, CRP, and if possible, it is recommended to perform a stone analysis in first-time stone formers. That is, we want to know which type of stone it is. 
uh, and we may you know give some uh, uh, recommendations for the patient. When it comes to management, uh, our management depends on the patient scenario again. So if patient has renal colic, they have bank pain of really with significant pain and vomiting, uh, you have to control the pain. So uh, with regard to controlling pain, you know there are NSAIDs, opioids, and uh, other class of ana analgesics. So what's recommended is to use NSAIDs. These non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, uh, they work to reduce the pain in different ways. Uh, one is obviously to reduce the pain, analgesic effect. The other is they have kind of an indirect uh, way of reducing the renal blood flow to that of obstructed kidney. So that also reduces the amount of kidney uh, urine being filtered into that kidney and in, uh, that reduces the intrarenal pressure. Uh, so that also reduces the, the renal distension. So it is, it is a, in my practice, it is common that I see people giving tramadol or petidine as a first line treatment for colic, but it is not really the recommendation. The recommendation is if the patient has normal kidney function, it's better to give NSAIDs. So NSAIDs would include ideally uh, drugs like ketorolac would be recommended, but we don't have that. So we may try diclofenac with some restriction. Uh, and there have been uh, studies that have showed that adding antispasmodics has no added benefit in relieving the pain. Uh, I see some patients being referred with hyosin as part of their pain management and there is no significant advantage. So we don't really use it all the time. Uh, use of opioids is not recommended. Uh, tramadol and petidine especially, they uh, increase the vomiting. So they are not recommended as first line uh, analgesic options. Uh, and parastamol, parastamol is better uh, if we don't or if we cannot give uh, diclofenac or other NSAIDs. Uh, the other part of really pain management is drainage. So if we drain the urinary tract, uh, patients will not have pain. So drainage is part of the recommendation. Uh, as part of the disease management, uh, in addition to pain, if a patient has sepsis because of an obstructed kidney, or renal failure because of an obstructed kidney. Okay, if they have obviously febrile, white blood cell elevated, significant CRP elevation, and severe tenderness. If patients are septic, then giving antibiotics is not enough. Uh, like every part of our body, if a, a tubular structure, if a fluid containing structure is blocked and infected at the same time, drainage is really more critical, even sometimes more important than the antibiotic. So if patients have significant flank pain with fever, none resolving with antibiotics, if you are suspecting obstruction, then uh, decompression is very uh, important. So we have two ways of decompressing uh, the urinary tract. One is uh, percutaneous nephrostomy. So you see with the use of an ultrasound, we put a small tube in the kidney, usually the size of maybe eight French or 10 French, much smaller than a urethral catheter. And it will drain the kidney and uh, patients usually get off fever usually quite quickly. Uh, other, other alternative obviously is a transurethral stent. As you can see, we, put, we use an endoscope to place a tube from the bladder all the way to the kidney, bypassing the obstruction and uh, patients will usually uh, be relieved by, uh, from their infection or renal failure. Uh, whether one is better than the other is really up for debate. But when it comes to their success in reducing the fever and uh, improving kidney function, both of them are of equal uh, capacity. Uh, ideally, the only difference is if you are trying to put a ureteric stent like uh, this from the, with a cystoscope, usually that, is, that requires uh, in the best setup at least some sedation and uh, X-ray exposure to confirm the placement. So if you are dealing with somebody who's very weak and you cannot give them anesthesia or some sedation, then a stent may not be preferred. While the percutaneous tract uh, placements are usually done under local anesthesia with the use of ultrasound only. So that is really uh, more preferred for patients who are much more critical than a stent. Otherwise they are equally effective in relieving uh, sepsis and uh, renal failure. 
coming to the treatment options. Uh, so before we go to the actual interventional treatments, uh, we need to discuss about medical expulsive therapy. So medical expulsive therapy discuss uh, is uh, uh, an option of treating ureteric stones in patients who come to us with acute ureteric colic. Uh, it has been uh, demonstrated that it gives the best benefit for stones in the distal ureter. This is very important. So when we say the distal ureter, it is the stones below the lower uh, pelvic uh, or below the sacrum. So if there are stones below that and they are more than five millimeters in size, it, is, okay, it has been shown to have the best effect. So when we choose medical expulsive therapy, there is a group of drugs we will, we will choose. Uh, the alpha blockers as a, a, as a class, that is alfozosin, tamsulosin, and now new, newly available drugs like psilodosin, which are generally given for BPH patients. Uh, they have been demonstrated to provide uh, some advantage uh, in terms of stone passage for patients who have distal ureteric stones because the ureter has the same class of uh, smooth muscle, uh, uh, smooth muscles in, uh, like the bladder neck. So uh, we give alpha blockers for about four weeks, hoping that this dilation or dilation of the ureters will allow the passage of the stone. Uh, in addition to alpha blockers, there are other medications. Corticosteroids have been pre pre uh, described like dexamethasone, uh, PDE5 inhibitors, that is like sildenafil has been uh, described. Calcium channel blockers like uh, nifedipine have been rec uh, recommended, but all these drugs in a, they are usually given with the alpha blockers. There is insufficient data to recommend them as additional for the alpha blockers. So uh, you can use these things, but they may not give you any ad added advantage compared to the alpha blockers alone. So in our practice, in our country, we want to minimize the cost for the patient, and we really, really don't need, don't give them anything more than alpha blockers. Of course, you can give patients some uh, NSAIDs, as we discussed. They do help for the pay, for the pain, and also they help uh, by reducing the edema inside the ureter, so making it really more likely for the stone to slide out. Uh, so at the end of the day, uh, the medical expulsive therapy, uh, like I said, it is recommended for stones more than five millimeters in size, but keep in mind that it doesn't mean that all stones will come out. So uh, after usually uh, four to six weeks, we need to do an ultrasound and look at the stone, whether it has passed or not, whether it has progressed or not, because sometimes uh, the assumption is you give patients the medication and they go home. And they have to come back because if they don't come back, if the stone has not passed, there is going to be progressive kidney damage. So more important than a complete ureteric co obstruction leads to permanent kidney damage after six weeks. So we have some safety uh, where we can try to follow these patients uh, within a period of less than six weeks. Uh, the last slide, the last line uh, mentions about uh, chemical uh, dissolution. Chemical dissolution. Uh, so uh, there are obviously different type of stones, but no, there is no medicine that has uh, been discovered so far that reduces stone size or that dissolves stones, unless unless it is for pure uric acid stones. So if a patient has pure uric acid stones. Uh, uric acid stones are uh, very dependent on the urinary pH. So if a person has a normal pH, the uric acid uh, stones dissolve very quickly. And the risk factor for uric acid stones, as most of you know, is a low acidic, uh, acidic pH urine. So if you give them medications, usually something called potassium citrate, uh, if you give them potassium citrate to alkalinize the urine and get the pH above 7, even stones that are present in like one centimeter or 1.5 centimeter stones may be able to be dissolved, but they have to be pure uric acid stones. Any other type of stone, it will not dissolve, and there is no other known medication to dissolve, uh, at least tablets that dissolve uric acid, uh, any other kidney stone. So in times where we have a stone which we cannot manage conservatively, 
we need to decide for intervention. And this really depends on multiple factors. So these are the most important uh, factors that we see. So we need to look at the stone size, the stone location, the density of the stone, which we measure by a CT scan, complexity of the stone. Uh, that usually means whether a stone is like single present in the renal pelvis or whether it has some branches in the other calyxes. Uh, we need to know whether there is infection, there is obstruction, how many kidneys does the patient have? That's really uh, also important. The availability of the different technologies and uh, other patient factors like patient obesity, patient comorbidities, patient preference, uh, even positioning related uh, issues may sometimes be uh, part of the selection uh, criteria. Uh, so on the right side of the slide, you see that our outcomes are usually, these are the things we consider. So we have, uh, we need to consider the stone free rate. That is how much of the stone will, will be clear by this intervention. It's not always 100%. Uh, morbidity, so whether this patient, uh, you know, like how long will the patient stay in the hospital? How long will the patient stay at home? The need for anesthesia. So some treatments require general anesthesia, some treatments require sedation, some require nothing. Um, whether a patient will need additional procedures or not, and the complications. So there are different treatment options as urolithiasis is a common problem. So, but generally speaking, there are about uh, four options for uh, treating kidney stones. The first is uh, shockwave lithotripsy. We'll discuss each of them. Uh, urethroscopy is another alternative. Percutaneous nephrolithotomy is a third alternative. The last is open surgery or laparoscopic uh, surgery, which is pyelolithotomy or nephrolithotomy. Just for uh, description purposes, uh, the first uh, is extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy. So shockwave lithotripsy is a, a dedicated machine, as you can see here. Uh, it's a special machine which has different components. So the first component is an imaging uh, mechanism. So we, uh, if you look at this picture, the the, the structure at the top and the bottom is an X-ray machine. Most of the time we use an X-ray machine to locate the stone. So that is the first component. The second component is uh, what we call a therapy head. That is the treatment component. Uh, so this uh, machine uses sound waves, which are focused into a specific point, And we use it to fragment small stones into small pieces. And we expect them to come out spontaneously. And so this is a really uh, complicated machine. It requires its own technician. It requires its own investment and a uh, dedicated room. It's not something you can just move around. Uh, and it is uh, maybe the least invasive type of uh, tre stone treatment option. And it's not really the best for all. We will discuss uh, where, as which, are, which ones are the best uh, option. But Shockwave Lithotripsy uses just waves of sound and these waves of sound are targeted on the stone, and they were usually, if successful, they will be, uh, they will fragment the stones into small pieces, and these small pieces will come out with the urine. The second alternative is uh, urethroscopy and uh, RIRS. So RIRS means retrograde intrarenal surgery. So urethroscopy is, uh, we just put a small, very small, very tiny endoscope into the ureter from the urethra and uh, when we encounter the stone we will fragment it with a uh, with some lithotripsy mechanism of course uh, urethroscopy requires anesthesia at minimum spinal anesthesia or general anesthesia uh, because the urethroscope will travel in the ureter and the ureter is a very small structure and it's going to be painful once we get to the stone of course we may break it with a laser or uh, another uh, pneumatic uh, lithotripsy device, which is which uses compressed air to fragment uh, stones. Uh, so in, any of them are uh, equally effective and urethroscopy is really useful for stones inside the ureter, especially when they are less than 1.5 centimeters. Uh, RIRS describes a new modification of uh, urethroscopy where the machine has the ability to go directly into the kidney from the ureter and bend in different calyxes and fragment kidney stones. 
So initially, urethroscopy was only limited to ureteric stones. But now with the technology uh, of providing flexible endoscopes, we can go into any calyx and uh, with the use of laser, fragment stones into uh, small pieces. Uh, it is uh, really the rising, uh, uh, the rising technology when it comes to management of uh, small and medium-sized stones. Uh, the third alternative is percutaneous nephrototomy. So uh, percutaneous nephrototomy is reserved for uh, large stones, uh, especially more than uh, two centimeters stones and special type of stones, which are maybe less than two centimeter. So using uh, percutaneous nephrototomy is a way of uh, accessing the kidney directly from the skin using an ultrasound or a floor X-ray machine. And we will go directly into the kidneys and with the, with the use of an endoscope, we will break the stones and remove them piece by piece. Uh, so this is uh, the third alternative, and it is uh, one of the best uh, treatment options for large stones uh, because it has a very high success rate. Also, it has a small increased risk of uh, bleeding because we are puncturing a kidney which is extremely vascularized. Uh, it is usually worth the risk. Uh, most of the patients don't develop complications. The last option is when the stones are either too big or if the other alternatives are, are not available, we can uh, make an open surgery onto the kidney and remove the stone, or we can use laparoscopic approach and remove the stone. So this is the algorithm uh, when it comes to uh, stones uh, in the kidney. So when a kidney is, when you diagnose a kidney stone, we need to look at uh, the different parameters. So the most important one is the size. So if a stone is greater than 20 millimeters in size, the number one alternative is a percutaneous nephrolithotomy, as it offers us the highest stone free rate. If not possible, then we can go for either RIRS or shock wave lithotripsy. Uh, these guidelines are taken from the European Association of Urology, uh, 2022 guidelines, which has not uh, been revised after that. Uh, the second uh, with regard to size is 10 to 20 millimeters. So these are the kind of the, uh, the middle ground for stones. So you can go in any direction you want. You can go for shock wave lithotripsy or uh, percutaneous nephrolithotomy or RRS. If a stone is less than 10 millimeters, which is relatively smaller, then we can go for shock wave lithotripsy as a first option or RRS. Then if not successful, we can go for percutaneous nephrolithotomy. But uh, keep in mind that, uh, as you can see on my slide, when it says kidney stones, it says all but lower pole stones. This is important because lower pole stones are special. They are special in a way that they are hard, harder to treat than the rest of the kidney stone locations. Because the lower pole stone of the kidney, uh, it usually has a narrow infundibulum, so any treatment that is just targeted at fragmentation may not easily uh, remove all the fragments into the ureter. So if you have a lower pole stone, then you need to use a different algorithm. So if, you have, if your stone is lower pole, then immediately if it's more than two centimeters, you go immediately like the above, so that's a PCNL. If it's less than 10 millimeter, again, you go more shock wave or RRS. But if it's between 10 and 20 millimeters, then you, you need to look at the uh, calicial anatomy. So you want to look whether the calyx is narrow or long, uh, if you see things like that on a contrast CT scan, then you don't do uh, shockwave, but then you go immediately to endourology. But if it's a wild, ca wide calyx uh, kind of uh, anatomy, then you may choose uh, shockwave lithotripsy. Uh, what's not mentioned here is, in addition to the stone size, the stone density is a very important uh, factor. So on a CT scan, uh, you can measure the stone size, and you can also measure measure the stone density. That means you can actually measure how dense the stone is. And uh, the, the software usually gives you the stone density in terms of Hounsfield units. And if a stone is less than 900 Hounsfield units, it means it's relatively softer. So it can be broken down by the shock wave lithotripsy. But if the stone Hounsfield unit is above 900, then it means it's a hard stone and hard stones are uh, resistant for shock wave lithotripsy. So it's important to keep that in mind. Uh, when, it, when we come to ureteral stones, ureteral stones, uh, our management is a little bit different. 
if it's in the proximal ureter, if it's greater than 10 millimeters, first option would be urethroscopy, either anti-grade, that is you can come directly from the kidney by puncturing the kidney, or you can go retrograde. The second alternative would be shockwave lithotripsy. So if it's a little bit bigger, shockwave lithotripsy is not a good option. If it's less than 10 millimeter, as usually the first option is shockwave or urethroscopy. For distal ureteric stones, First option is urethroscopy. Second option is shockwave lithotripsy because they are easier to access and the stone clearance, uh, stone free rate is higher with urethroscopy compared to shockwave lithotripsy. So this is a summary of the three main uh, interventional options in uh, urological stone management. These three are really, uh, what are the current standard treatment options uh, globally? There will be some modifications when we come to, for example, PCNL. You may have, you may hear of something called mini PCNL, micro PCNL, but these things are just some modifications. But in general, these are the parameters that we will look at. Just uh, the size of the stone, the size of the stone, the advantages that we see. So if we have shock wave lithotripsy. Uh, is best for small to medium sized stones. Well, urethroscopy is also best for medium to si uh, small sized stones, while PCNL is best for medium to large stones. Uh, the least invasive is shockwave lithotripsy, but it's also the least effective. And the highest uh, stone free rates are associated with PCNL, but they are also uh, highest com uh, hospital stays, highest complications are also expected for PCNL. Uh, you see that procedure duration may vary from one hour to two hours. Hospital stay as usually uh, shockwave lithotripsy is an outpatient procedure where while urethroscopy uh, can be done as an outpatient or a one day stay, PCNL usually two to four days is required. Time away from work, maybe five to seven days for shockwave lithotripsy and urethroscopy while PCNL is usually one to two weeks. Uh, when we come to consider complications, shockwave lithotripsy basically almost has no significant complications, while urethroscopy has some anesthesia-related complications, infection, hematuria, uh, and PCNL has some risk of bleeding and adjacent organ injury. Uh, other considerations that we need to take is uh, when we do shockwave lithotripsy, uh, there is a very high likelihood of requiring a second or repeat sessions as uh, the technology that the stone breaks, the, uh, the machine breaks the stones is, uh, it's quite complex, but it will not completely break all stones in one session. So you may require a second, third session to break the stones. Urethroscopy, usually uh, one special consideration for it is it will need a stent or some kind of tube to drain the kidney. Uh, again, PCNL also needs that. Uh, the success rate, uh, shockwave lithotripsy has a variable to low to medium success rate. Urethroscopy has a high success rate and PCNL also has high success rates. So these are very important components that we need to consider. Uh, once the stone has been removed, we need to give some general recommendations regarding stones and uh, prevention. So these are the main uh, recommendations that we usually give for our patients. Uh, reducing animal protein intake is very important. Uh, so there is no exact amount to be recommended, but we recommend that patient animal intake is, should be less than 0.8 grams per kg per day. That is less than 0 0.8 grams per kg per day. So somebody who is maybe 70 kilos or 80 kilos would be required to eat less than a quarter of a kilo per day. So it's not bad, but uh, it's very hard for patients to stick to this kind of recommendation. Uh, generally, uh, I recommend my patients to avoid eating any animal protein maybe three times a week. So basically like uh, fasting. So uh, that's really one thing uh, that's highly recommended as it relates to 
urinary pH, urinary, uh, urinary uric acid concentration, and urinary acid, uh, acid uh, acidic status. Other things uh, that we recommend is reduce salt intake because uh, sodium in the urine is usually carried with uh, sodium and uh, with calcium in the urine. So hypernatriuria is related, related to hypercalciuria. So we want to reduce that. So salt intake should be restricted. Uh, or almost or every person knows that you need to drink lots of water, but uh, the number is very variable. So the goal should be to have to produce about two liters of urine per, per day. So if a person is a very athletic person who sweats a lot, you know, if you tell them to drink three liters, it may not, may not be much. And some the person who is not active may drink a small amount. And what we usually recommend is to target our urine output rather than amount of water we drink. So the target urine volume should be two liters per 24 hours. Weight loss is recommended because weight gain is related to uh, stones. Uh, and also even uh, diabetes may be related to stones. Type 2 diabetes is also related to uric acid stones. So uh, weight loss is part of the preventive tool. And citrate uh, in the diet. So citrate uh, in the urine is one of the preventive uh, chemicals in our urine for uh, stone formation. So we may want to increase our citrate uh, in our diet. So, uh, you know, diets containing citrus fruits like lemons and oranges are recommended. And sometimes we even recommend uh, potassium citrate as a supplement in the, as a tablet. With regard to follow-up, uh, we may do yearly ultrasound yearly urinalysis and uh, renal function tests, just as a step to monitor uh, for uh, recurrence. Uh, patients may, usually they will default from these uh, routines, but if a patient has been stone free for one or two years, you may you know, skip one year or two. Uh, but if it's really recommended to catch a stone really early because the smaller the stone, the least invasive treatment we can recommend for these patients. Uh, so uh, these are uh, some of the points I uh, hope to give you in this presentation. Uh, that's the end of my slide. Uh, thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much for the brief practical and well explained uh, presentation, uh, doctor. Uh, so before proceeding to the Q&A session, uh, while my partner is attaching the link to the post-CME quiz, um, I um, I have a notice to give you. Uh, I have a notice to give you. So, yet uh, is partnering with Society for Endocrinology and Metabolism of Ethiopia, and um, they are doing the, their second annual scientific conference and health exhibition, and so they have the CME sessions uh, starting from yesterday, March one to March four. Um, and they are all uh, freely accessible to any healthcare professional who wants to join. And today's topic uh, is going to be approach to adrenal mass, uh, medical and surgical management. So we hope uh, uh, we will see you later on. Um, it, it will start at 7 p.m. Um, at 7 p.m. Uh, East African time. So um, the link uh, to the uh, endocrine uh, CMEs will also be posted here. Uh, but uh, we want you to do the, we want you to fill the Google form uh, now. In the meantime, we can proceed with uh, uh, with discussing the questions forwarded. Dr. Mahadit, if you can uh, display the questions forwarded by the attendees. So, can you see them? Uh, yes, I have to zoom in. Yeah, what okay. about Rovatinx capsules? Okay. How can we differentiate between the type of stones, indications for open surgery? How common is the occurrence of mixed stones in one patient? Uh, okay, so when we start with uh, Robotinex. So Robotinex is something we encounter uh, on most of our uh, practice. Uh, uh, so far, the content of Robotinex is, is very variable. It's not an internationally accepted drug per se. It's, more, it's like a supplement. Uh, so the regulation for supplements is different than the regulation for actual drugs. So even in the United States where uh, they are very strict about what they allow to be in the market, 
Robotinics is placed as, and Robotinics and other drugs, other medications are placed as supplements. So uh, from our international practice, from all the research that has been done, there is no clear evidence that Robotinics will help in uh, the evacuation of stones. Uh, but we usually, you know, it's marketed as a way to, to remove stones, to dissolve stones. And uh, we uh, we don't recommend against it. But if a patient has an uh, obstructed kidney, for example, like a ureteric stone or a pelvic stone, and they are taking robotinics, we don't uh, believe that it will uh, relieve that uh, obstruction. So we uh, basically, it's uh, if, a patient, if a patient has small stones, uh, if our recommendation is going to be just to increase water intake and to exercise, then they can add robotinics. But there has not be, been any standard recommendation as uh, our papers that demonstrate the effectiveness of uh, uh, the effectiveness of uh, robotinics. Uh, my second the second question is how can we differentiate between types of stones? So types of stones, uh, you know, it's not so easy. Uh, the only thing we can, the, the only type of stone which we can diagnose by imaging, uh, at least by the basic imaging, is uric acid stones. So you know that uric acid stones are completely radiolucent on X-ray. So if you do a KUB and there is no stone, but on uh, your ultrasound and CT scan, they show you uh, like a one centimeter or two centimeter stone, then that is very likely to be a uric acid stone. But the other type of stones, it's very difficult to determine by imaging. So we have to take the stone out and do stone analysis. That is, uh, there is a special type of uh, machine called uh, Fourier transform uh, uh, infrared spectrometry or something called FTIR, uh, which is used to detect the minerals. So it's usually used in mineralogy, you know, uh, or in geology. So there is a small machine that is similar to that. And it will be, we will, we will you know, crush the stones and uh, we will use uh, we will use that machine to detect uh, to detect uh, the type of the chemical ins inside the stone. Otherwise, by imaging or something, uh, except for uric acid stones, we cannot differentiate. Uh, indications for open surgery. So, if we are uh, talking uh, internationally, uh, the indications for open surgery are very very limited. Uh, in the rest of the world, open surgery for stones is about you know, considering all the options, uh, all the types of treatments, maybe one to five percent of uh, kidney stones are op treated by open surgery uh, in 2023. That is in internationally. So uh, most of the stones can be managed with endoscopic management. But, uh, uh, you know, one major indication is the availability of the technology. The other indication is if a stone is very large, even in the presence of uh, endoscopic management, we may recommend open surgery because open surgery, uh, especially if it's a big single stone, it gives us the highest stone free rate because we just go and pick the stone out. So if we are going after stone free uh, uh, rates and if we have a very fixed, like a single big stone, then uh, open surgery may still be recommended. Otherwise, the indications for open surgery are being very limited. Uh, how common is the occurrence of a mixed stone in one patient? It's, it's fairly common. It can happen uh, usually with uric acid stones. So uric acid stones, are uh, they occur in patients who have low urinary pH. So patients who have chronic dehydration, some malabsorption syndromes, who take large amounts of protein. If once they form uric acid stones, they may uh, also uh, form uh, calcium oxalate on top of the stone as a focus of uh, enucleation. Uh, so mixed stones are possible. Uh, question five is, which intrarenal stone has high chance of dislodging to the ureteric stone? Uh, upper, upper stone, upper ureter versus lower ureter. So if you are just uh, asking versus whether it's upper or lower pole stone, obviously it is going to be an upper pole stone, but uh, again, upper pole stones, they're going to be lodged inside a calyx, and after the calyx, there is going to be an infundibulum, and build, after the infundibulum is going to be the renal pelvis. So if the if the infundibulum is tight, then the stone is big, it will never come down. 
And in opposite, if, uh, if a person has a lower pulse tone and the infant develop is very wide, that person's chance of the lower pulse tone migrating into the ureter is higher. So if we just uh, use uh, common logic, and it's going to be an upper pulse tone, upper pulse tones have a higher chance of migrating to the ureter rather than lower pulse tones. What is lowest cut point for recommended procedural management? That is surgical management. Uh, when we think of uh, the smallest point, they are usually uh, seven, eight millimeters for uh, renal stones is the lowest and anything above that can be managed with some intervention. Uh, stones less than that can be observed. And depending on the size of the ureter, whether the ureter can accommodate this kind of stones, uh, patients may pass the stones spontaneously. Okay, one more question from the chat box. Calcium is not reduced as a treatment? Uh, yeah, that's a very important question, actually. Uh, uh, calcium, uh, the, so the role of calcium in uh, urolithiasis, obviously most stones are calcium based. So uh, we, the assumption would be we, if we reduce calcium, uh, we would reduce stones, but that's not really true uh, because Calcium usually binds with the other chemicals to form a stone. And the most com common chemical it binds with is oxalate. So when we look at the, the pathophysiology of oxalate metabolism, uh, we do produce some amount of oxalate in our, in our body, but some amount of oxalate we also absorb from our diet. Uh, so uh, if, a patient, if a patient is a stone former, and uh, when they are taking calcium, like milk or uh, yogurt or whatever, the oxalate in their diet is going to bind with the calcium and pass unabsorbed into the large bowel. And when they, re when they reduce calcium, when they strict, especially when they are very strict in reducing calcium, the oxalate is going to be unbounded, it's going to be freely absorbed into the body, and it's going to increase the amount of oxalate in their urine, which is going to increase the amount of stone formation. So even though it sounds paradoxical, Calcium restriction is not recommended in uh, the majority of stone formers. In the majority of stone formers. So we, when it comes to calcium, we recommend just a moderate amount of calcium intake in most patients because the restriction is usually associated with increased stone formation. So unless it is a specific type of pathology, most stone formers should take some amount of moderate amount of calcium. And uh, the last question, I, the number eight, I think I see is uh, what is your recommendation regarding giving alpha blocker for small ureteric stones? So for small ureteric stones, uh, like I said, uh, the research has shown that alpha blockers have the best benefit for stones which are greater than five millimeters. Uh, so if a stone is less than that, you can give alpha blockers, but uh, if you can compare 100 people who take alpha blockers and 100 people who don't take alpha blockers for small ureteric stones, you may not have uh, you may not have uh, a, a no significant change. So um, for stones less than five millimeters, it's optional. That's uh, a significant advantage is not expected. Can hydration truly improve nephrolithiasis uh, duration? So what I'm assuming is, can it prevent nephrolithiasis? Uh, so when it comes to hydration, uh, you know, uh, stones, I, like we said, it is uh, really the result of a complex uh, problems. It's not just uh, about the amount of water we take. So just because somebody is, you know, taking large amounts of water that we are recommending, we don't expect them to be free from stones because the diet is important, the weight is important, the family history is important, uh, whether they're having a specific metabolic abnormality is important. So it, we cannot guarantee that hydration will uh, prevent stones in all cases. And like you said, the second question, the duration. Uh, even if we tell a patient that it will improve, uh, at least to some degree, prevent uh, recurrence of stones, it's very hard to be disciplined and drink that amount of water every day for the rest of their life. So most of the time patients come with recurrence because they will default from the, uh, from the regular uh, recommendation and usually they will uh, 
eventually end up going into like reduce the amount of uh, fluid intake. They will start eating meat again, and they will usually develop uh, recurrence. So these are not guaranteed preventive options, but just ways of reducing their incidence. Okay, thank you, Joe. These are the questions so far. Since we have a time constraint, let's go to the quiz. Discussing the quiz with the answer, then we'll wrap up our session. Dr. Mironi can share the quiz. So this is something I did not mention on my presentation, but uh, the old uh, uh, thinking has been uh, uh, staghorn stones were always related to uh, infections. But nowadays, when we find patients with staghorn stones, the new studies are showing that maybe 50-50 is metabolic versus infection. And actually, about 55-60% of patients have metabolic stones. So the answer is A. Uh, just something uh, to, uh, interesting to discuss. So best candidates for shockwave lithotripsy. So now we are talking about stone size, location, and density. So like I said, if a stone is uh, 900 Hounsfield units, lower pole, 2.5 centimeters. So this is the largest stone inside the lower pole of the almost a borderline density. Second is a nine millimeter proximal ureteric stone with density less than 780. A one centimeter stone in the upper calyx, morbidly obese patient, so morbid obesity usually is a contraindications for shock lithotripsy. So ideally from these patients, you would choose B as, a, uh, as the answer, uh, as the stones which are uh, for best for shock lithotripsy. Ureteric stone patients presenting with acute flank pain. So this is one of the points I try to stress on. So a low dose non contrastity is the best investigation. Uh, so answer is A. An indication for ureteroscopy in patients diagnosed with ureteric stone. So failure of stone passage after six weeks on follow-up. Like I said, we can follow after for six weeks, but if it does not pass out, that is our, one of our indications. Hematuria is not an indication. Stone five millimeter in the distal ureter is not an indication. Absence of uh, hydronephrosis is also not something we will consider. So the answer is A. All right, uh, thank you very much for the session. And I would also, uh, um, uh, at the end, I would also like to introduce um, the hostess. Uh, so I was your host, uh, Dr. Mirren, um, and my other hostess were Dr. Mahadit and Dr. Tadei. Uh, so thank you all uh, for your time. And thank you, doctor, for your dedication. And with this, we're gonna be ending our session.